So originally, I, I was going to focus on some recent work in, uh, regarding the coupling of uh, gauge potentials to uh, background metric. But I thought that I would better use my time uh, rather than jumping into the middle of some work that's still in progress of uh, really motivating what I'm doing in the context of some recent but completed work. So uh, my overall goal is comes from uh, somewhat of a foundations of quantum mechanics uh, perspective. My overall goal is to make sense of the theory. Uh, on the one hand, it explains the stability of matter uh, and predicts uh, strong no non-local correlations, both of which have been observed. We observed stable matter and we've done EPR experiments in the lab and observed uh, uh, the consequences of quantum entanglement. On the other hand, uh, the measurement problem suggests to many, myself included, that the theory is somehow incomplete, and I think it's, this is most evident when one uh, applies it in a cosmological uh, scenario. And it attempts to include an account of measurement, so I'm thinking of uh, things like Bohm theory or many worlds, uh, don't seem entirely satisfactory, and I would uh, point out that none of them to date uh, addresses the cosmological constant problem, which is something that sort of seems to come right along with quantum mechanics and is arguably a kind of a field theoretic uh, uh, analog of the, uh, ex of the stability of matter. So we have a non-zero uh, energy in a vacuum state. So this is just by way of motivation. Uh, the viewpoint that I'm taking is that quantum mechanics is a phenomenological theory and that its statistical character simply reflects limitations on our knowledge. Okay, so this is sometimes called a, uh, a, a view, uh, a psi epistemic view. So the wave function encodes in part our ignorance of what's really going on in a given situation um, or the existence of a uh, board behind me. Uh, though such a viewpoint might seem to run up against Bell's theorem, so Bell's theorem seems to indicate uh, to many that one can construct a, a hidden variable theory, uh, which is what one might think if one thinks of quantum mechanics as phenomenological. Um, this isn't necessarily the case. Really what it does is it tells you that any theory that you construct must violate one of the assumptions that goes into Bell's theorem. And I think that a theory in which states, uh, states of the world are subject to non-local constraints so as opposed to local constraints like, a, uh, like the Gauss law. Uh, Non-local constraints is one in which the statistical independence assumption of Bell's theorem is violated. So I have a recent paper on that, although that's, it's really a, um, it's an explication uh, of an arguably older idea. So non-local constraints. I've done some work on this uh, recently in the context of uh, an area of real, uh, related interest, uh, which is multiple time dimensions. I wanted to see whether one could make sense of physical theory uh, in the presence of multiple times. So some recent work by Walter Craig at McMaster and myself uh, shows that one can have a well-posed initial value problem, That's a, which is, this is a, a co-dimension one initial value problem, uh, in the presence of multiple time dimensions. For, we did the simple version, a, uh, a scalar field could be massive or massless. Uh, via the imposition of an, an explicit non, uh, non-local constraint on the initial data. So the idea is that you, can, you can't freely specify initial data on your um, initial manifold, but we set down a constraint such that uh, anything that satisfies the constraint uh, is guaranteed to evolve globally into the future and the past and uh, stably, and there's a conserved energy and so on. So this is a something novel, uh, possibly of interest, but uh, it's, it's certainly an example of a straightforward theory with a non-local constraint. And an even simpler example it would be a theory uh, on an ordinary space-time, which is uh, ordinary except that it's temporally compact, so a sort of um, flat space-time but compactified in the time direction. So it has closed time-like curves. Uh, in the absence of interactions, it's not that hard to write down the constraint on the initial data. It essentially has to be periodic in the uh, circumference of the uh, compactification. Now, I think that this, there are some interesting indications that this sort of theory, um, and 
these kinds of non-local constraints might be relevant to understanding quantum mechanics, at least in the sense of understanding the origin uh, of non-local correlation. I'd point to some recent work of Scott Aronson, who's here, and John Watrous from the University of Waterloo, uh, showing that uh, the presence of closed time-like curves as a kind of a computational resource renders classical and quantum computing equivalent, so that you can do more in a classical world uh, with a classical computer using closed time-like curves uh, than you can otherwise uh, in, a, in a world without them. Uh, so this suggests that some theories of non-local constraints may allow one to generate uh, at least some subset of quantum phenomena. So there are other theories of non-local constraints. You could, you know, you could get them uh, in, in various ways, not just through CTCs. This is a, a, just a sketch of the idea that I've been pursuing with uh, Jonathan Hackett, who's a grad student at the University of Waterloo, having to do with um, essentially thinking of gauge potentials as non-local hidden variables. Now, ordinarily, gauge potentials are local. Uh, you can do a, a gauge, gauge transformation in a, in a region of space is uh, independent. You can do gauge transformations with compact support. Our idea was that in, in uh, the context of gravity, uh, depending on how one addresses the variation of the action, uh, one might get a kind of a non-locality via the potentials and their coupling uh, to the stress, uh, their, the role they play actually in the stress energy. So in particular, we're uh, trying to investigate the consequences of Really, the non-gauge invariance of the action. So this is the this is the action of just a uh, of a charged fluid or a charge a set of charged particles coupled to the electromagnetic field. It has this term in it. This is the interaction term. This is clearly not gauge invariant. The value of it changes under a gauge transformation of a. It's well known. Uh, in fact, it's an exercise I believe in Jackson that. Uh, the equations of motion of the electromagnetic field are independent of gauge transformations, despite the non-gauge invariance of the action. We're looking at what happens, uh, though, to the variation of this whole metric with respect to, uh, I'm sorry, the, the entire action with respect to the metric. And we get an interesting um, surface term, uh, which we are trying to uh, understand the physical significance of. Dep we get a surface term depending on uh, a particular choice in uh, of which uh, variables are independent. Okay, let me stop there, and if anybody would like to talk about this some more, I'd be happy to. Thanks.